Has this been a year or what? Man. <laughs> I'm glad it's late year because I'm leaving <laughs> over this year. I'm telling you, it's like, wow. I, it's just, wow, oh, man. Interesting, interesting. You know, I just like, but the Lord, just, just for fun, I just, oh, what, last week you could hear broke down twice. That's not good. Um, snowed in last week, was sick, didn't want to go anywhere, but the grocery store, because that's where you go when you're sick. <laughs> and so Laura says, you can't do that, honey, it's ice. And so I go, oh, no, I grew up in the South, honey, I, I can handle it. And she's standing in the driveway while I'm leaving, <clears throat> and I can see she thinks I'm being cocky, and I'm being confident. I go all the way to the store, come back, <clears throat> get a little cocky, slide through a whole four-way stop, wind up in a ditch about five foot deep, four foot deep. And I thought, is this a parable? <laughs> and so um, I can't get out. My truck is three-quarters of the way tilted, 45 degrees. It's like the guy across the street says, you're going to flip that truck over, man. I go, so? He's like, this year it's not happening anyway. So anyway, so I try and I, I finally, so I can't get out of this, this ditch. It snowed in the whole bit. So I, luckily I'm a, only a block and a half away from home. I called AAA because I thought they were actually an angel on assignment, but they weren't. <laughs> three days later, no AAA shows up. I made a lot of phone calls. I talked to Jesus. I did a lot of stuff, and I said, uh, man, you know, so they said, well, we can't find anybody. So I'm expecting some good news. They go, we can't, sir, we can't find anybody that's willing to pick up your order. I go, surprise. That's my year. You know, nobody's willing to pick up your order. So whoever, so nobody in Nashville will do it. So the third day, I get a call, and the guy says, at AAA, here I'm Josh, whatever his name is. I'm on the way. You're in the ditch? I go, yeah. <laughs> I'm confidently there. And uh, he said, uh, okay, I'll be there. He said, do you, need a, do you need to be towed or you need to just winched out? I said, no, just winch me out, please. So he gets there, and I, I meet him there. And uh, he looks at me, and he looks at me, he goes, sir, I'll winch you out. Can I tell you something? You can drive this thing out of here. I know you can. Oh, God, I don't need that. I don't need that right now. You know, it's like, this is a tough year. I mean, trying to start this year off, I, I'm done with challenges. He said, and he goes, no, dude, I'm, he's just a sweet guy from Murfreesboro. The only guy coming is from a guy from Murfreesboro, three days. And he said, I can winch you out. And he said, I think you can drive it out. If I, you, I, I just give it a try. I said, are you kidding? He said, yeah. I said, he said, I'll do it, but you can do it, man. I know. And I'm thinking, is this guy an angel? Or, or, what, what is, he, is he preparing me for this year or something? I'm in the ditch, and I'm calling AAA and when I can do it myself. And so I said, okay. You know, so I did. I backed up, and I got all the way to the end of the stop sign and bounced that thing out on the road. The truck comes out, hits the road upside down. He runs in the truck, and he goes, you the man, you the man, you the man. I, need, I needed that. I really needed that. And uh, I said, I wish my wife was here. You know, I was like, <laughs> he goes, you the man. I told you you could do it. He said, man, you can drive. I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I said, do they pay you for coming here? Because <laughs> I didn't know if he was an angel or actually a triple A guy. And, uh, and uh, he said, yeah. And I said, well, here's some more money. I mean, you know, I was like, you know, anybody encouraged me like that. So, uh, Anyway, it's been a challenging, I thought, I'm all that. Then, gosh, it gets colder than the heater breaks down in the house. Anyway, I'm not going there, but it's, it's been an unusual uh, year. Uh, yeah, very, very, very unusual uh, year. So I want to give you two, um, uh, two addresses, and I uh, just want to talk you through something. Um, and uh, I think it's important, and... I think it's very important. If I didn't, I would be doing what I'm doing because if you don't think what you're saying or is important, if you don't think driving your truck out of a dish is a big deal, it is. It's just important. Uh, um, then you shouldn't be doing it. So uh, I thought, boy, I just do not feel like even 
breathing, much less on my feet this morning. I'm going, that's, that's all right. I'll drive this ditch out, this, this truck out of the ditch. Or, and you know, I like, I'm done with that. So not doing that. So anyway, I want to talk to you about this year. Uh, and I just want to have a talk with you about some of the things this year that uh, begin to stir in my heart. Because I thought I said, it's, it's pretty close to Sunday. I need something to say. And, uh, and so I started thinking through things, and the Lord's speaking to my heart and putting some things together. So I want to give you two addresses. I just want you to turn there. We'll get back to them in a minute. I want to give you some uh, uh, upfront talk before that. But it would be Exodus chapter 33, verse 1, and then we'll drop down three or four scriptures in verse 1. Exodus chapter 33, and also Psalms 51, 10, um, and, uh, and 11. And so um, those are the foundation for what I want to talk about uh, here. So let me put some stuff together that is like you don't know where I'm going. I'm not sure where I'm going, but I know I can get out of the ditch eventually if I keep going. And, um, uh, but I do think I do have, I think I've got a glimpse of something. I think I got a glimpse of this year. This year needs some help. And uh, where we're at, we need some help. We need some direction. We need some encouragement. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's like, boy, I preach a sermon the other a couple of weeks ago called the best of times, the worst of times. I got home and it said it should have been the worst of times, the worst of times. Uh, but did I get that wrong? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I said, no, no, no. I got to believe God for this. But anyway, I'm just venting. I'm just venting. I know you guys are absolutely overcoming gloriously going down the road of life at 100 miles an hour. Sure. Anyway. So, um, if, um, if you're there, I was thinking about the year. I know you know this, uh, or perhaps you know this, but this year is a leap year. So what does that mean? To a prophetic guy, we never let anything get by us like that. When you say leap year, go, oh, there's something there. So this year is a leap year. Leap year is always a significant year. I'm not an expert on leap years, but I'll take a leap of faith and talk about it here in a minute. Um, and that... Uh, of course, not every four years, but according to the calendar, according to how the math, I don't know all the math about that, pretty much every four years is a leap year when they match up the heavenly and the Gregorians, and I'm saying it right, and the astronomical calendar, and et cetera, et cetera. And so there's an extra day added, some about every four years. And so that extra day, so that fourth year, which they call leap forward, it's a forward year because it gets an extra day. I didn't know, I have forgotten. Uh, till uh, yesterday uh, that uh, this was a leap year. And, uh, and they're very unusual year. I was thinking back, what was the last leap year? 2020, COVID. So there's a very unusual audit that's happened, seemingly like in leap years, both in a positive and a negative sense. And before that, 2016, leap year, Donald Trump. Go wherever you want to with that one. Uh, I thought that was great. I mean, that was a big upset. Then before that, 2012, Obama. Go where you, I mean, there Things, things from, from the left and the right. I mean, things, just things that we really weren't planning on happening. Leap years are interesting years. And you can track them all the way back and find out there is an algorithm, if we can say it that way, or there's a thread through leap years of things, oddities, and, and things that are unusual that happen in leap years. And I thought, I'm ready for an unusual year. I'm ready for uh, uh, leap years. So, so what does it mean, Lord? Say, so what are you talking about? What, what is it about this year, this leap year? What is it about this leap year that makes it important? What is it that I need to say, that I need to align myself with, that you're doing this year? What is important? If you could give me one thing, Lord. I'm asking the Lord that. This, I'm asking him that about 3 o'clock yesterday, evening because I don't know if you know it or not, but i got to speak tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, so I need, I need some help here because uh, I kind of got a sense that uh, something's up. But what is it uh, uh, that, about that? And so, as the Lord does with me, just, he doesn't, no audible voice, no, you know, no fire and rain, but, but just this sense, this is awareness, this knowing, this little, uh, little something emerging out of my spirit, just thought, I go, oh, that's the, oh, my, okay, I know what, it's a significant year, I know that. And this is what I felt the Lord put in my spirit. The decisions we make this year, this is a year of decisions. Leap years are always a transitional year and year of decisions, 2020, 2016, 2020. It goes all the way back. There's a lot of decisions that shift the trajectory of the nation, of the, your life. I mean, it's really interesting. Leap years are very interesting. So I said, Lord, so this leap year, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the 
what is the overlay for this, this leap year? What is it that we need to be looking into? What is it that, uh, what are you saying if you're, if you're saying about this year that's important that I need to talk about, that I need to parse through and figure out? And this is exactly the words that came to me in my spirit. The decisions you make in this leap year and the priorities that you pursue will define the next 10 years of your life. It's an important year. This is a major tipping point year. It's a major transitional year. This year is a year of alignment before an assignment. This is a year of getting it together. This is a year of making the right decisions and tact and, and, and connecting to the right priorities, that will affect you and shape your life for the next decade or so. We're going to live the next decade or so in the room of decisions that we have made this year. Now, I know that's saying a lot, and you can argue with me on that, but that's right. I have no problem with you being wrong. I'm confident. So I was saying, okay, so what is it, Lord? So help me reduce this down to the lowest common denominator. Okay, I get this as a year of decisions. Because listen, what you talking about decisions? Do you see the decisions that have to be made? Political decisions, religious decisions, civil decisions, uh, national decisions everywhere. It's a chaos. A lot of important decisions are coming down. So I said, so what is it in my arena and the churches and the churches? Uh, uh, life. What is it? What are you expecting? What is, it? What, what is the one most thing, or the one thing that's been the most important thing in my life that I must prioritize and recapture and decide about this year and lean into this year? And I believe the Lord told me what that was. I've been thinking about it, but not in the context of leap year. But my leap year resolution is the pursuit of the presence of God. It's my leap year resolution. Everything else is secondary. I'm going back to my first impressions. I'm going back to what brought me where I'm at. I'm going back in dance world that brought me here. And it's been building in me, and I've been thinking about it and thinking, okay, what does that mean? What's the presence of God? I don't know all you know, that, but, 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 but I do enough to know that I want to talk it through with you. It may not be perfect. may not be... Uh, 100% uh, clear to you, but I think there's going to be enough meat in there for you to go, okay, this year's a valuable year, and I'm not giving it away. I'm driving this thing out of the ditch. I'm going to make some decisions. I am going to go forward, and I'm going to go forward with, with intentionality about what it is that needs to be important in my life. What do I need to get back to? What do I need to recapture and re-embrace that brought me to where I am now that I have let go of that will shape the next 10 years of my life because in 10 years, I'll be 83, and you do not want to be around me in 10 years <laughs> if I have not made the right decisions. I'll drive your truck in the ditch <laughs> and call it prophetic. So what is it? And, uh, so it's the presence of God. So we will give you some biblical context uh, for that. And... Um, and I will tell you just a story about my life and the context of the presence of God and what it is and what it means to me. Exodus 33, I know you're familiar with this, and where God says to Moses, Moses who is uh, leading the children of Israel to the promised land and taking them from devastation to, to liberation, and he's bringing them to a place and uh, uh, that, a land that flows with milk and honey. It is a major advancement. It is a, they're getting a pay grade raise. I mean, it's like, it's great, it's wonderful. And Moses is the man to take them there. And um, the Lord says to Moses, here's the deal, Moses. I'm going to take you and let you go there, and you're going to lead this people, and you're going to be very successful, and you're going to take the land, and you're going to conquer I'm going to send my angel before and with you to take you into this place. But my presence will not go with you. And I'll get back to the word presence in a minute. My presence will not go with you. And in verse 15, I want to pick it up here. There was a little back and forth between God and Moses. And Moses said to God, and I want you to get this. I want you to get this with everything in you because it resonated in my spirit like, yeah, 
I'm in on this one. I'm doubling down. Moses said, I appreciate the supernatural. Let me put it in context, my modern-day language, what Moses was saying. I appreciate the angelic. I appreciate the supernatural. I appreciate all that stuff. I appreciate are you sending me you know, this, this, this heavenly stuff and helping that way. That's great. Love, that's wonderful. But let me tell you something. If your presence, your presence does not go with me to bring me out of here, I'm not going anywhere. Wow, what a decision. I mean, the Lord said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you amazing spiritual insight. I'm going to give you like an, an archangel to take you. I would have gone, I'm in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say me, yeah. But Moses had something about the presence of God because of get again presence. It's about, it's about a face-to-face encounter. It's the Hebrew word ponim, uh, which means the face or in the face. And uh, he says, if your presence don't go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? I am determined that God is going to go with us this year in First Ford. I am determined to argue that out and to talk to God about that. So, so he said, Moses said, so Lord, do that so we would be separate. And your people and I from all the people who are on the earth. I mean, it was the primary argument that Moses had is that the only thing that's going to separate us from everything else on the earth is not the supernatural, not just angelic experiences, although those are wonderful, not just gift and ministry, but if your presence goes with Because if your presence don't go with us, there's no separation and we're just wasting our time. And if your presence don't go with me, I, I'm not going. That's, that took a lot of guts. I mean, he had, listen, he was offered a big deal job, a CEO deliverance job. And he said, unless you go, unless your presence go, you can send all it. But I'm not going, nor is his people are going, because I want to make a definition between those are the people that at that time were not walking with God and us, that we have the mark of the presence of God in our life and on our life. Let me jump here and I'll get back. Psalms 51.10, David says the same thing, King David. And King David says in Psalms 51, he is what an amazing man like Moses. He's a deliverer. He's a warrior. He's a poet. He's a musician. He's like everything you could ever imagine. He is a shepherd. He is a king. He is like, oh, my gosh, this guy is like, wow. And he has everything that you can imagine as far as gifting and talent and, and, and favor with God. And he says this just in his wilderness time before he launches into a greater part of his ministry. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Get this. And cast me not away from your presence. Do not take it. David had the same priority going there. I I appreciate all that. Give me a clean heart. Don't remove your spirit. But but more important, do not remove your presence from my life. Because if you do, I'm done. These two guys know something I'm not sure the church today knows. Both of them knew if your presence, if it's not about the presence of God, it's not about your presence being with it, we can do all this stuff, but we're still done. It's still not going to work. So he says, your presence shall not, don't do not take it from me, or, or nor take your Holy Spirit from me. So the most common Hebrew word for for presence, I hope I say it right, it's panim um, in the Hebrew word, panim, and which is often translated face, implying a close, personal, face-to-face encounter. It is, the pre- in other words, someone's presence is in, you know, someone's presence, in other words, you're in their presence, you're before their face. You have, you have an encounter face-to-face with them. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a face-to-face encounter with the presence of God. I've been there. You've been there. Do you remember when you were there, when it was like that, when you could feel that presence, when that presence was upon you, when that awareness was on you, when you was like, wow, wow. How long has it been? It's just been a long time. In the English language, the countable noun presence, presence says a countable noun, is defined 
as a personal entity that you cannot see, but you, you're aware of intuitively. I can't see, but I can feel, and I have an aware, a situational awareness of the Spirit of God. Now, let me say this, and I'm going to move on. This is a departure from what I want to say, but I need to throw it in here. It's not that great. It's not a great analogy, but I think you'll get it. It's not that we have so much lost the presence of God. It's just that our awareness has been dulled. And it's still there. And I'm going to give you the stupidest analogy, but you'll get it. It is good. It's first grade. I call it the cologne principle. You ever put on deodorant or cologne, and when you put it on, you go, who do I smell good? Like, wow, I smell. And then 15 or 20 minutes later, you can't smell it anymore. Your sensory, you can't pick it up because your sensory glands have become familiar to, the, to what is on you. Someone walks by you and goes, boy, you smell good. They can smell what's on you that you can't smell. So we still have stuff that we don't understand or smell our presence on us or in someone's presence that we no longer feel, but yet other people can. And I've noticed that. I've known people said to me, boy, there's something about on you. And I said thinking, yeah, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like, because we have been accustomed to the Spirit of God and taken it for granted. And we can no longer smell it, although it's there, because our sensory glands have become familiarized with that, and we become a part of that. Uh, you know, we don't know it, but other people know it. That's why you sometimes preach the worst sermon in the world, and you'll always get somebody saying, that changed my life. And I go, That's, thank you. Because what is not that much to you is a lot to them, because they're in your presence, a presence that you don't particularly feel. Anyway, that's, that's an aside from, from all of that. So, was it Don Potter recently? I saw him again, saw an interview with Don Potter, and a recent interview when he wrote, Show Me Your Face, Lord. And he, for one year, he decided, I'm done with everything. I'm done with anything other than the presence of God. I'm going to take my guitar, sit on a stool, uh, and I'm going to sit in the corner, and for one year, every day, he sat in a corner and worshiped God to the wall for one day until God's presence filled. He said it filled his room. It was so amazing, and he wrote the song, Show Me Your Face, Lord, Your Power and Grace, that I can gird up my loins and stand in your holy place. Show me your face. So show me your panim, your face, God. Bring your presence back to my life. And he said the other day, as I was listening to him, it was the greatest shift in my life, and it changed my life. And it's like it was the greatest decision I ever made. And I thought, we're there again as a church. We're at a place where the presence of God and leaning into that presence and saying, God, show me your face. Let talk to me as your friend, as you did with Moses and with David and Abraham. A friend talks presence to presence, face to face. We're in your presence. You're in our space. This is that year. I think if we make that decision, it will define the next decade of our life. And we'll be on a path that we would not have been on had we not made this a priority in our life. So what does all that mean? So let me just tell you what it means to me. I know you know part of my story. Uh, as growing up as a preacher's son, a southern preacher, Pentecostal, extreme emotionalism, but gifted, um, taught to preach as a little boy, didn't feel nothing, it's just being obedient. Uh, radio programs at five or six years old, my dad, jail ministries, nursing home ministries, and you know, and it, I didn't know, I, I didn't really feel particularly anything, it just... I was just doing what I was trained to do, and, uh, and I had a heart for that to some degree and understood that. That's all that I knew. And I did that uh, for a number of years. They taught me Scripture. My parents taught me um, Scripture after Scripture, and they would actually sit me on an altar bench on a Sunday night service and do a quiz with me and ask me Bible questions, and I'd spit them out, and everybody would go, ooh. You know, the little ladies go, oh, 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 you know, and I'm thinking, 
And if you're so anointed, I'm thinking, <laughs> annoyed maybe, but, but anyway, so, so, and like, I mean, I, prepared, I was prepared for ministry. I was prepared for the things of God as, as a young boy. But I didn't understand it all, although I did know I, did, I had a heart for God and a love God. I, I loved rain because rain, rain just felt like God falling on me. I loved rain. I spent as much time as I could just standing in the rain. I was a Noah in the making. I didn't know that. And uh, because my granddad said to me once, uh, Larry, rain is wonderful because that's God weeping and crying on his creation. So as a little boy, I really thought as I stood in the rain that it was from heaven, it was a sign of God's tenderness, his weeping, and his tears for me. And so my, my upbringing was interesting. And I, I was in the, in the loop of ministry in that way in our little church and doing all the other stuff. The nursing homes got me because I'd come with my little mandolin and my white suit and play and sing uh, for people who were dying. And it was hard to watch that. And they would think they had Alzheimer's or memory, and they would think I was their son or grandson. And, and that was hard. And, you know, all those things were hard. But I managed it through because I thought this is my life. This is, you know, this is what I'm uh, called or, or told I was going to be. This is what made my parents happy and proud. And so I am the little minister guy. I had a white suit. I am a little, I'm Minnie Benny Hinn, you know. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and I can sing and did the little song stuff. And then give my testimony. I just want to take the Lord, save my soul, and fill me with the Holy Ghost. And I, well, he hadn't filled me with the Holy Ghost, but you had to say that anyway. You know, and so uh, thank the Lord I have no TV. I have no alcohol in my house. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't run around. I don't, it's like all that, you know, you know that's testimony. But it was like, you shouldn't be at six years old doing that anyway. You shouldn't have to say that. That was before TikTok, too. But anyway, so it was, it was interesting. At the same time, I had a love for you. My, my granddad was a Baptist who taught me a lot. He had such a wonderful spirit, Baptist elder, knew the word. My dad knew the word immensely, and he had a relationship with God. My dad, too, too, but dad didn't know the word as well. Uh, he was not educated. He couldn't read well, only the red letters. But, boy, was he gifted with a spirit of uh, a prophetic spirit, a word of knowledge, and he was just amazing. And if you haven't been here, you know, for a while, you, you've – not heard me say this, but some of you had. Dad was so prophetic, he would spank us before we sinned. <laughs> like, what was that for? What you're going to do tomorrow? You know, like, <laughs> that ain't right. Some about, some about that, some about the prophetic that knows stuff before it happens works against you. But anyway, but, but I, I, did, I, did, I did love that. I did love my dad. had an amazing prophetic and He had a love for Jesus that was, he just cries. All my dad would do when he preached would cry and talk about Jesus. He just wept. And so I picked up on that, and I, I, I saw that. And I go, I, that, that's real. I, you know, but for him, but it never was for me in that context. And so let me hurry this on. So I don't remember, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, um, we had no TV because we couldn't have a TV because we were Pentecostals. Pentecostals couldn't have a TV. There was not cable. There were antennas on the house. And the way they knew if you were not, or if you were, if you were Pentecostal, you didn't have an antenna, which was you don't have a devil's horn on top of your house. <laughs> and really. And so the Baptists had devil horns. That's what they called them. Yes, they called them. They've got their devil antennas on top of their house watching, you know, Beverly Hillbilly or something. It's like, anyway. So, so I used to sneak off, actually, in, in my, my aunt's house, uh, who was neither Baptist or Pentecostal. She just had a TV. And I'd watch through the window of the TV. I was fascinated by all of that. And I would get a spanking all the way home sometimes when I was caught watching television. And uh, couldn't say shoot, couldn't say darn, couldn't say golly, because those were cuss words. And uh, I, maybe they are, I'm not sure, but, but I got a lot of spankings for doing that, you know. And uh, so uh, anyway, so I'm now 10 or 11 or, uh, years old, so no, no, no TV, no radio, couldn't have a radio, couldn't drink coffee, but coffee was a drug. We couldn't, I mean, I couldn't wear sh shorts. Uh, to gym. I couldn't go to gym. Jim couldn't wear shorts because dad said, you do not want to show your nakedness, Larry. And I thought, if you see my legs, you would be no problem anybody lusting after me. And I was like, it's like, you know, there's white, then there's clear. 
I don't even know how to attract a sunburn or tan and skinny legs. Anyway, and so I couldn't, couldn't join the Boy Scouts because that was communist. I don't know. I mean, you'd have to live in my world. So I grew up in a very legalistic, Pentecostal, 1950, decade of that 50s. Uh, world is like, it was just, wow. It was, uh, it was quite interesting. But I, there was always something in me that loved God, that loved standing in the rain with my face to the sky, loved lying in the backyard, looking at the Big Dipper all night long in the heavens, and just asking God, where are you and who are you? And, and intuitively knowing that all the stuff they said you were, you're more than that. You've got to be more. You can't be that mean, you know. And uh, so I never got an answer. So by the time I'm 12 or 13 years old, I hear the first rock song I ever heard in my life. And I thought, gee, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about right there. And it was jo Johnny Rivers, I think. I don't know if it was Memphis, Tennessee, or I don't know, maybe that was later on, you know, long-distance information giving Memphis, Tennessee, helped me find a party that could get in touch with me. And it was like, and it was like guitar licks that I'd never heard in my life because although I played guitar and mandolin in church, we could only do open chords, not bar chords, because bar chords were evil. Because they had, uh, our minor chords were definitely evil and demonic, so we'd only do G, C, and D, and a three-chord turn around. Anything other than that, you're going to hell for that. I mean, you put every once in a while, I put a sixth or a seventh in there, and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's like, whoo, man. And um, so, I, and I was, and I, I, it's like, I want to do more than that. Because, I, I mean, I heard, and then I heard some rock music, and I go, I don't know what that is, but I'm in. But I knew that wasn't going to work in the church at all, <laughs> at all. Because, you know, Dad had told me, I think later on the Beatles would come out, and he goes, the Beatles are demonic bugs from hell. And anyway, that's what a Beatle is. I don't know. Wasn't sure. But so I hear, and I decide, okay, that's it. So long story short, so tw nearly 12, 13 years old, I run away from home. I run away from home and with a, a little group, a musical group, to play nightclubs in Memphis, Tennessee. I live in Arkansas. The spirit of stupid working in me right there to kill my mother. I mean, it broke her heart. She cried forever. They finally found me after two or three weeks, sent the police after me, brought me home, my dad cast seven devils out of me, <laughs> took the guitar away, or the, you know, uh, but I still couldn't get it out of my system. I just knew I'm looking for something. I need something. I, I, I'm doing all the right stuff. I, I, I'm ministering at the jail and the little radio program, the, the, the nursing of the church and giving testimony, and everybody going, oh, and plan to get, but, but there's just, I'm not feeling it. There's nothing there that tells me that this is amazing, that, that satisfies my soul. I was hungry for something that I didn't know what. It feels like I was starving for something that I didn't understand. So I thought by the time I'm 18, you know, might as well just get married, find someone getting married, and you could do something in life. So I married the girl next door that I didn't love. She told me, I, by the way, I was not quite 18. She was not 18. Her father and mother signed for her, and I turned the day I turned 18. We got married because she said, I love you enough. You don't have to love me. I go, I'm just being honest. I don't. So just note to self, just for, you know, this is for marriage counseling. Don't marry anybody you don't love. That's not good. <laughs> I liked her, and she, and she was convinced that, you know, I was on. So... By the time I'm 20, I have two kids, and I'm no longer having to go to church, not a part of the church on that uh, level anymore. Now I'm playing nightclubs. For the first time I hear Jimi Hendrix, I go, I just went to heaven. I'm tell oh, man. It's like first time, I, you know, and so I'm playing nightclubs. And um, now in my early 20s, I'm trying to take care of two kids, uh, making a living trying to play nightclubs. And uh, I wasn't a part of, I didn't, it wasn't part of the drinking, didn't drink, didn't drink, because I was into the music more than that. I didn't want anything to harm that, and I was just raised different. Than that. I just didn't do that. I didn't mess around. I didn't do, you know, didn't uh, commit adultery, didn't do that. And I just, like, I, didn't, I had no interest in that. It was only something I was trying to find in the music and in my life. And uh, so 
now I'm 22 or 23 years old, and I'm getting really, really sad because I can't find it. I was playing some really ugly places where go, there you go, go, you wouldn't know what they are today, but they call it go-go bars where cages where women dance. And, and so all the men were groping at them. And I'm the guy that's afterwards going by and talking to them. I can feel their heart trying to minister to them. And, uh, and I don't even have a preacher's license yet. And uh, because my heart was just looking for something, my heart would really hurt for people. But I couldn't do the church thing. And I just couldn't do the arduous, legalistic, it doesn't matter if you did Philly, God's mad at you. If you step out of line, he's going to send you straight to hell and smoke your feet. And it's like, it's just like, I just didn't understand that kind of a God. And, and especially, you know, one that didn't at least give me a pat on the back once in a while make me feel good. And so I am losing altitude. And so my group was called the Frogtown Boogie Band. And my nickname was Frog. And, uh, and uh, everybody on stage were backslidden Pentecostal. The keyboard player was a backslidden Pentecostal. B. Hammond B3 keyboard player for his dad. The drummer was saying, we're, we're just all backslidden uh, from the church Pentecostal kids trying to make it in the rock world. Uh, but I was growing weary with that. Long story short, I cut the chase. And so we borrowed some musical equipment from a Pentecostal church because the drummer's brother went there and he let us in without telling the pastor to take some of the equipment from the church to the Black Orchid nightclub. (laughs) We didn't know that was a sin. Matter of fact, it was commendable to death as far as they were concerned when they found out because not only that, we broke in to do it. We broke in a church to get godly instruments to take to the Black Orchid go-go Nightclub. <laughs> Where we were jamming to 2 o'clock at night. Again, I never, I never drank there. I never did, it was about the music. And, uh, and it was about trying to find something in life. Important. And <laughs> so they come to get the equipment. And when they come to get the equipment, they bring um, uh, a guy with them. I never heard of this, these two guys. One of these guys was named Harry Brown. The other guy was a little a guy, 24 years old, named Russell Taft. Russ Taft, Harry Browning, a couple more uh, guys come, and uh, they uh, they hear me. So I was pretty good then. Um, and before arthritis, I still had my hands, and I could, I could do well. And uh, so they heard, and I didn't know they had made. They got among themselves. They are starting the first rock gospel group in the South. There was no other. It was called the Sounds of Joy. Russ Taff was singing, you know, later went with the Imperials. You know who Russ Taff, he's a legend. And, uh, but we're all in our younger 20s. And uh, so they conspired, like, we've got to get that guy back with God because we need a guitar player. That was my door back to the Lord. They need a guitar player. And so they invited me, said, we're doing this thing at this church. Invited, we're playing and we have this guy. And I'm thinking, rock gospel, those are incompatible terms, according to Jimmy Swagger. Because I heard him say, you're playing the devil's music, you're going to burn in hell. You know, I was like, okay, okay, okay. And boy, I was like, rock gospel music? I mean, whoever heard that was like, what is that? I mean, it was, we were, it was demonized. It was crazy. And so one group got smart and named their rock gospel group the second chapter of Acts. I thought, that's pretty smart. But anyway. Yeah. So, so I, I, they said to me, uh, would you come Sunday night? We're playing. We're doing this thing on Sunday night. This church is a, a lot of young people. There were a couple hundred young people, so, uh, you know, that, that were coming. It's just it's this move of God was happening there. The Methodist uh, lady that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and her, and her husband started this church for young people. And, and there was, as the Jesus movement had started, I didn't know anything about that, but uh, I was invited. I don't tell you why I went, but I finally went. I went reluctantly because I made a deal with God. I said to the Lord, I wanted to buy this car, and they wouldn't sell it to me. I said to the Lord, I still talk to the Lord. I, I said, Lord, if you will let me have this car, I, I'll do a trade-up. I'll go to church next Sunday night. Like the Lord going, whoa, yeah, let's give him a Cadillac. <laughs> and so I did the card. I got the card. I don't know how I got it, and I thought, oh, I've got to go. And so it's Sunday night, 
And it's like, I, I, I don't want to go. I'm going, I think I'm going to another Pentecostal gig somewhere or whatever. So I go, so I walk in this place. And, uh, and women, there's women there with makeup on. And that is a sin from where I come from. And I thought, I actually thought every woman was named Jezebel that wore makeup. I thought that was just their name. But <laughs> my sisters couldn't wear pants because that was wearing a man's apparel. Really. My mother couldn't shave her legs because that was a Jezebel spirit. I couldn't shave my legs either. <laughs> that, they wouldn't know what to do with that, but my sisters couldn't shave their legs. But what they would do was there was a product came out called Nair, which was a chemical you could put on your leg and it would melt the hair away. That was godly, but shaving them was demonic. And you, you'd have to grow up with me. It was like interesting. And I thought, oh, boy, I'm, go I'm going back to one of those kind of deals, going to that thing, except this guy, they say they're a rock gospel group. There's no such thing as that. It's a trick. Anyway, I go there, and I walk in the door, and I think I'm going to go hide in the back. And I look the place over. I'm late, of course, when you're backslidden, you're late. And so I'm late, and I'm looking. There's only place I said is on the front row, right in front of the band, the only chair in the whole place. This place is back. And I thought, she me. So I go sit down there, they do the gig, and all of a sudden they're playing rock, they're playing gospel music, but the head was rocky, and I thought, wow, how, how, how are they getting away with that? So I thought, that's not playing well upstairs, I'm sure. I like it, but Jesus must, is not supposed to, even though he's called the rock. But anyway, I'm going too long. So, so, this sounds a joy, five, four of them there. Their whole goal is to get me saved because they heard me play guitar. They liked, I did well. They, they needed a lead guitar player. And so they did an altar call. Now, I've been through altar calls. In the Pentecostal church, an altar call means there's no hope of getting saved. There's just hope of losing a lot of mucus and tears from your face. And getting on the, and just, and, and just begging and pleading with the Lord and get up and go and do it the next Sunday. And you get resaved every Sunday from watching TV Wednesday. Or saying darn. And so, altar call comes. And they're doing this altar call. And then it's five minutes, then it's 10 minutes, then it's 15 minutes. And they just keep going. I go, they're not going to shut up to someone get saved. And they're saying, you got to come. And they're crying. And, and all the time they're saying, you need to give your life to God, and all of them would look at me. And I'm on the front, and I go, gee, you know. And, and I'm under conviction here, but I don't know what's going on, but I know this is a defining moment in my life, but I don't want to be there. And I thought, wow, what's, what's all this? And so they go, they go in like 20 minutes, and their altar call was me. And they were determined to get me saved that night and um, play guitar for them. So, so, I, so I, I couldn't do it anymore. I'd sit there and I said, this is, so Russ Taff said, okay, you won't come up. You've crossed the deadline. That's no Pentecostal thing. There's no return, you know. It may not be a return for you. This may be the last chance. And you may wind up in hell somewhere. And like, eh, okay. <laughs> Close it out. And uh, they said, so we're, we're doing one more line of this song. And if you don't come forth and give your life back to God, no, look at me. If you don't come, and everybody look, looks at me, and I'm thinking, yeah, if you don't give your life back to God, this is it. This is your last chance. Because in the Pentecost, it was always your last chance to the next chance. This is your last chance. And so, and he said, we will not, this is it, last chance. We will not, the Spirit of God will not tolerate or beg you anymore. He's done if you don't come up now. I'm thinking, thank you. So I'm not going up. And I said, so, but I'm under conviction. So I said this in my head to the Lord. Lord, that man, Russ Taff, said he wasn't doing another course, another verse, and plenty more if nobody went up. If you would have him change his mind, and I'll know it was you, and if he said, if he asked for another line, always said he wouldn't, I will go up and give my life back to you. Can you believe my life rested on that? Because I was sure he wasn't going to do it. And I was sure because he said he wasn't going to do it, and he looked like he was ready to go home. And so, so they start taking their guitar off. 
Russ had a guitar. He was taking his guitar strap off. The piano guy had got up and started walking away. The drummer put his drumsticks down, and they get, and I'm thinking, boy, I sidestep that salvation, and I'll find God, but in another way. And Russ stops, and the place is quiet. He turns around, comes to the microphone. He said, I know I said I wouldn't do another song. But he said, I'm walking off, and the Lord said to me, Russ, do one more chorus. And I went, shoot, fire. <laughs> now, if I don't go up, I have lied to God, and I'm definitely going to burn in hell. <laughs> I won't even have to shave my leg. I won't have any hair on my body. And so they do another one. I run to the altar. I, I've done it a hundred times in the Pentecost church, but this time, run to the altar. I'm serious, Lord. Okay, I, I did. So I give my life back to the Lord, and, and they're praying for me. And uh, if you confess through the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I never heard that scripture in my life. All I heard is I quit watching TV, can't go to the movies, and I argue going to hell. Never heard that scripture. Never heard that scripture. Grew up in church as a minister, as a son, and never heard if you confess with the Lord Jesus Christ in your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If somebody told me that when I was a kid, things would have been different. But I had to quit doing stuff to have God's favor. So I'm there uh, on the, uh, and uh, I get up, and they go, uh, you know, you're, you're saved. And I said, I don't feel anything. I don't feel nothing. They said, you're not supposed to. The scripture says again, if you'll confess with your mouth, you did that. The so Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart, God raised him dead. You're saved. It doesn't matter what you feel. And I go, nah, something didn't feel right about that. I said, you know, I'm into feelings. So I, I go home. On the way home, they said, by the way, Nick, come next Sunday night. And I thought, no, nah, not doing that. Don't feel lead. Don't feel nothing. The only lead I felt was in the seat of my pants. I didn't want to get up and go do it. I just done. So the next Sunday night, I, I felt this nudge, and I thought, I, you know, I, okay, I'll go. So I go the next Sunday night, and I go the next Sunday night, there's a guest speaker named Vicki Jameson. And you probably never heard of her. Uh, she was a Christ for the Nations graduate. She was, had this amazing ministry in the 70s. This was 1973. She had this amazing ministry. God, what a healing gift and a word of knowledge, this compassion, she, all she did was pray all the time, worship before the Lord. She had this, she carried, there was an awe. There was this something around her. You could feel it when you got in her space. There was this prayer. They would talk about it. And I thought, I got to go see what this is, what this woman's got. And so I, I, I go there. And she, very, you know, and first of all, I shouldn't be there because the Pentecostal church, women were not allowed to preach at all. You were allowed to rule in the church. You rule your husband, but not the church. <laughs> so, 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 first of all, women preachers of sin suffer not a woman to teach. I grew up with that, our preaching, the church, and I've actually seen women shut down in the Pentecostal church because they testified too long. And they couldn't come back. So I was just, I, I was not happy with stuff, but I love God and wanted something. I just knew something. Anyway, I'm looking. And, um, and so she seems sweet, her name's Vicky, and then this is what she says. She's in a message, she says, okay, if, how many in this uh, building and I want to see the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I thought, what's the Holy Spirit? I never heard that word. I grew up with the Holy Ghost. And it, I didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. There's a Holy Ghost. And that's a contradiction of terms anyway. How can a ghost be holy? I was always afraid of the Holy Ghost. I didn't know it was the Spirit of God, the kindness of God. That, literally, that's what religion will do to you. If you're not, and well-purposed people, meaning wonderful people, gift. Oh, my thing, my dad was so good. My mom was so uh, compassionate, love, fruit of the Spirit, gifts. Of the Spirit, all that. But their theology was just not there. She said, so how many will see the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, she would have said, how many will see the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I would have ran out that door. And I would have been gone as quick. And I thought, I don't know what that is, but I think I, yeah. So I raised my hand. So they said, well, go with this guy, a guy named Harry Browning, who later married Pat Boone's youngest daughter, became friends of mine, and a musician, travel. Anyway, so he, at the time, his name was Harry Browning. 
And he was a, a YWAM graduate, uh, Lauren Cunningham uh, student. And so, so uh, Harry, and he said, there's a guy back there named Harry, and he's got the hot seat back there. I thought, I never heard of the hot seat. So he'll put you on the hot seat and get you filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thought, I don't know what that is, but it's nearly as close to playing nightclub as I can get. Put on the hot seat, get you filled with the Holy Spirit, because I don't know what the Holy Ghost thing is like, because I thought the Holy Spirit was like Casper the Friendly Ghost. My dad was thrown out of a church for saying Holy Spirit once mistakenly instead of Holy Ghost. They told him, we don't want that newfangled language in this church. It's always been the Holy Ghost, always will be the Holy Ghost. Okay. All righty then. So, so I go back there, and they set me on a stool. And Harry looks at me and says, well, you're here to receive the Holy Spirit. And I go, yeah. He goes, uh, you ain't speaking tongues? I go, what? Wait a minute. I've seen a lot of that. I don't think I want to do that. So anyway, so they minister to me for like 20 minutes. Have you got it? You know, come on. Say, say something. Go grunt. Sigh, do something, go, holla, woo, yeah. Do something, yeah, 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 yeah. So I finally thought, okay, I, I, I do, I, 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 groanings and utterings, do some, something. And so they started screaming, you got it, you got it, you got it. And I'm thinking, I ain't, I ain't got nothing. I don't know what's going on here. And so they got it. So they said, we're going to take you out. So they take me out. They lead me out into the sanctuary. Vicki James was standing on a high stage here. Russ Taft, the guys were doing music behind her at the end of the service. And, and they said, this young man just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I thought, I did? Well, I spoke in tongues, but it was Arkansas. It was hillbilly. Because <laughs> nobody understood me from California when I moved up. But anyway, so, 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 so he was with the baptism, and I thought, I did? And Vicki Jameson turns to me and goes, oh, oh, and I could feel this. She carried, there was a presence. There was something about her. There was something, she emanated something that was like, whoa. And she said, oh, and I'm from here to the driveway. I mean, like, this is a long building, the front of the building here. I'm that far away. And she goes like this, well, just bless him, Jesus, and just fill him. And that's the last thing I remember. I remember all of a sudden this force hitting me. And I went completely unconscious on a, con on, 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 and, uh, on, on a concrete floor, fell backwards on a concrete floor, never had a bruise on my head, and was totally unconscious. And when I began to awaken on that floor, the sounds of joy, Russ Taft, the group were around me. They were all excited about what's happening to me. Now, I wasn't just yielding. I was out. I was out. Never happened to me before. And when I began to come to consciousness on the floor, I, for the first time in my life, felt the presence of God. The, the, the love of God. No, no, no. The pre, I, there's, you can't even explain it. The awe of God's presence. The kindness of God. The love of God. And as I lay, I, I lay there, it was like I could hear spiritual electricity, like 220 electricity going in the atmosphere. And it was just like, like electrons and, and atoms falling on me. It's like the universe was, it's like, it was, and I felt something, I feel so clean. And when I would breathe, I could hear my lungs squeak. I was so clean. No sin, no remorse. No, I was, I, the presence, there was something in me that had never been there before that was transferred or that was, that this woman I caught from her something she carried. She was known for the presence of God. And I couldn't get up. They, they helped me up. My legs are wobbling. My, and, I, and, I, and I thought, I have never felt, I just wanted to run and never stop running for joy. The joy of the Lord, the, the kindness, the, the presence. No more regrets. No more self-condemnation. No more, it was like, it was like, oh my God, it just like, any kind of drug or alcohol, any other stuff would have never come a million miles from this kind of a feeling of self-worth, of a feeling of being loved, of a feeling I'd never had that before. And when they saw it, one of the guys in the group hugged me. Russ Taft actually grabbed me and hugged me. The first guy in church, I'd never been hugged by a guy. It's, even under the Holy Spirit, it still felt weird. 
I, I'd never hug a guy, you know. I saw that ain't right, because we know that ain't right either. So, but anyway, he hugged me and just held me, and, and I could feel his love, and it was like my life changed that moment. Something touched me that wasn't just teaching, wasn't just preaching, wasn't just gift. And I had a prophetic gift as a kid, a pretty good, and, and, and I love the gifts of the Spirit. It wasn't just that, it wasn't just something, something the presence of Panim, the, the face of God, the sense of awareness of his presence and his sovereignty, his awe was in me. And it's like, man, I could feel it. I feel it was, it was in every atom of my body. And as I left that night, all night long, I lay there and just shut, just buzzed. The next day, I decided I'm going fishing. I don't know why. I just thought it sounded scriptural. That's what Peter did. And so I went fishing. I caught more white bass than I ever caught in my life. I just reeled into me. I was like, man, this, this holy, this badge of the Holy Spirit, this is the deal. He's like, yeah. And, she was, and I just could, I couldn't stop. I began running. I couldn't stop running. I ran until I was out of breath. Just ran for joy. Just ran. I was free, free from religion, free from just the drudgery of do's and don'ts. There was, there was, there was, a, there was a presence around me. There was something tangible I could feel. And I said, I never, ever, ever, ever want to lose this ever in my life. You know, famous last words. I got in the ministry and lost it. But anyway, I, I don't mean got in the ministry. I mean, in other words, leaned into the mechanics of a lot of things. And, uh, and then years later, didn't, not very, it was a long time before it stayed with me for years. Begin to have, I, I, I couldn't preach a lick, not that I do a great deal now, but I'm saying I had no theology. I had no. I would. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to pray. I didn't. Couldn't do that. And there would be times when I would just at such a presence in my life that I would just stand in front of the people, and never say a word, and I would begin to cry. And the spirit of God would fall in the place, and people were on the floor, flattened, people weeping. The presence they caught what I caught from what she had that she caught from what God had. And it's like, and it was only for years. I mean, I didn't have to lay hands on people that presence. I could just stand up next to them and pray for them, and they would be they're unconscious on the floor. And we had, at the time, we have catchers. Catchers are important. I know they're not in the Bible, you know, catchers, uh, because, you know, because you don't want somebody to fall down and break their neck because people are really losing consciousness. And so we always had catchers for that. And, and uh, sometimes the whole room would be flattened out. The whole, I mean, this happened in the early 70s, the Jesus movement, that was a you know, that was, that was just a part of what it was all about. And it was just like at the presence of God. And uh, I finally had a wise man say to me, after about two years of doing nothing but the gifts of the Spirit and the presence of God, couldn't preach a lick, he said, he said you might want to study up on doing a three-point sermon. And I go, who are you? He said, well, I used to be a Baptist preacher. I said, I figured that, yeah. That's, but, but I need that. I need that Baptist part. My granddad was a man of the Word. Uh, my father was a man of the Word the gifts of the Spirit, words and gifts. And I wanted both. And that presence, that presence, that you can't, I can't, even, you can't even describe it. It's just, I walked in it. I had visitations. The Lord visited me over and over. He would stand at my bed. And not a dream. I mean, literally the presence that, uh, my, that just, I had years of that. And I thought, wow, what could ever take this away from me? What? How could I ever not live? I'm addicted. This is like, but that's, it was there 50 years ago. And ministry, as I went through ministry and, um, and life, and started having more and more success, some of that stayed with me. A lot of that didn't begin to drift from me. And the last, probably up till about 10 years ago, I still had quite a bit of that. Uh, uh, but, it began to dissipate. And I will have to say, honestly, the last five to eight years, I said, God, do not take your, you've taken your presence from me. I can't live. I can't live without your presence. I, I can't live with the, just doing the prophetic, just preaching, just, just being, it's about, I gotta, I, I'm, a, I'm done. I need that. I'm used to that. I, it's my life. That's, yeah. So, 
so I've been saying for, and I'm ending here, I've been saying for the last three or four years, Lord, if anything that I desire the most, not a greater minister, not a greater gift, not a greater prophecy, not a greater visibility, not a greater audience, not, I, I, I've done all that all my life, it's fine. I, I, I'm going to die if I don't have your presence. I'm going to die. I am absolutely committed and resolved that I, I, I will not live this life in ministry without the presence of God in my life. And whatever it takes, whatever that means to embrace that panim, that encounter, that face-to-face -face with God, and to say, God, I love the angel stuff, I love the miracles, I love the prophet, I love the sound, I love the teaching, but unless your presence is with me, I'm a dead man. I'm, I'm just a walking ministry that's gifted, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just saying there's a higher route. There's a higher priority, and that's his presence. And when you have his presence, all those other stuff just happen. They just fall out of you. You don't have to try to make them happen. And by the way, when you have his presence, you'll never lack for an audience. People will chase you to the end of the earth because people are hungry for the Spirit of God. They're hungry for the presence of God. Again, David says, take not your spirit from me. Don't cast your presence. David had enough sense to know, I've been successful in a lot of areas. King, leader, warrior, all that, but without your presence, it's not going to work for me. So, I refuse to live the rest of my life in ministry without somehow embracing that presence and that level again. I still have some. So do you. It's the Cologne principle. You don't know it, but other people can see it and sense it in your life. And that's all right. But I think I'd like to feel that myself again. As I'm just being honest with you. This is a last few years of talking to people, knowing stuff, my own life. One of the most, the hardest times I've seen in my lifetime of hopelessness, despair, uh, depression. I tell you, it, that has been the strongest demon the last few years of my life. It's just, it's just I fight it. I fight it. I will not because that's a great departure from the presence of God to depression. From the high, yeah, it's like, ah, I'm used to living in the space of God's presence. And to go from there to fighting that evil, that sense of hopelessness, the depression, the, the whole business that seems like the whole world, something is going on, that's just not right, and I will not continue that. I have one, I have one thing. If I have one thing for this year, one resolution to pursue, it's not ministry, it's not gifting, it's not visibility, it's not anything, it's not money, it's not, it is the presence of God. If I don't have it, if I don't have it, I don't even want to be here. Because Paul said this. Paul struggled with this. He said, it's good to be absent you know, from this world is to be present in the presence of the Lord. He actually wanted to be in the presence of the Lord because of such distraught in his own life and such hopelessness he had to fight and persecution in his own life. So this is the year. So here's, so we're done. This is the year that we have to find our way back to the simplicity of the gospel, the presence, and the sense of the love of God and not just capitalize on the gifts or ministry or how many people view us or, or how large our prophetic platform is or our ministry or our church or whatever. We have to get back to what John said in the book of Revelations, return to your first love, to return to our first love. It's so simple in a complicated world, it's hard to do. It's way too simple for a complicated church. We're very complicated. And... Um, but it's simple. I don't know exactly how to do it except make the decision to do it. And I know this sounds crazy, but this is the way Larry puts stuff together. When I drove that truck out of the ditch, I go, I can do this. By golly, if I can drive that truck out of the ditch, 
I can get out of this depression. I can get out of this hopeless dish. I can, the world can get out of this dish. We can do this. I, I'm telling you, that's AAA. That's angels on assignment telling me I can get out. We can get, I can drive this thing out. I don't need anybody to winch me out. I can do it. I just make some decisions and get some courage in my life and just drive it out. And so what, is, what does that mean, I, you know, how, what I do, you know, to make I don't know if I can make it happen other than make the decision that it is first things first. And that priority is going to rule my life. And, uh, and, so, and it, it's just not feelings. You know, because feelings are trees. It's just not feelings. It is a tangible, panine force, presence, an awareness of God that penetrates the fiber and being of our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our body that Paul talked about us living in as a mind, soul, and body believer in God's presence. And uh, I believe if we do that this year, if we make that decision, if we walk toward that, this is a challenge, it will define the next decade of our life. If we don't, we'll struggle the next decade. I, I'm going to say it really clear as a prophetic word, and I believe it was a prophetic word. The decisions you make this year and the priorities that you put in place this year will define the next 10 years of your life for good or for bad. This is a serious year. It is a leap year, and it's time to leap forward. And it's time to leap forward and take serious that this is a change year, this is a transition year, this is us doing coming from somewhere to somewhere else. This is a uh, this is a this is a, a year of of recapturing our first love. This is a year of touching the presence of God. This is a year of getting our priorities right. This is the year of carrying His presence, and this is a year of giving away. His presence. And this is a year of walking with Him, walking in His presence, and we have to make that decision. We really do. I have to make it this decision, and I am going to make it. And uh, so at this point, now it's time to go, and I don't know what to do, which is when I said that, the Lord said, Lord, in ministry I've done so well, I now I don't know what to do. And He said, Oh, you're doing good. I'm glad you don't know what to do because that's been your problem. But in the past, you've known what to do. God's unpredictable, so unpredictable, uh, and we boxed him in. So uh, what do we do? I think I'm done. Uh, I just call this a Sunday morning chat. But, uh, and you know what? I mean, I, I don't feel like it. I, I don't feel like it emotionally, physically, my health, my, and neither do you. Half this room is sick with something. We're sick. The, the nation is. There's, there's some weird stuff on this nation, and it's affecting our emotions. There's, there's stuff in the atmosphere that we can't see that's affecting our mental. There, there, there's, this is a nasty time that we're in, and, and everybody is about a half a bubble off on some level, and everything that can go wrong seems to go wrong. It's like, wow, we have got to get out of this ditch. We have got to get back on the road and to... Uh, to the prop, uh, deliver the gospel to a world that is sinking into hopeless and despair. And we can't help them if we're sinking with them. We can't. So we have to be that to them that Vicki Jameson was to me. Gosh, never forget that. Her, what she carried. Oh, and I'll tell you this, and this is it. This is what I want. So I said to the Lord, what in the world does that woman have, Lord? What? Because she had words of knowledge that was crazy. I mean, like, I had an ingrown toenail that was so bad it was throbbing on my left toe. I had shoes on. The next session was there, and she turned around and pointed, and she said, oh, and that ingrown toenail on your left toe. God's not going to heal it. You need to go get it cut out. I go, who are you? But I like that. And she was so, she was so sweet, you know, with that. So I said to the Lord, Lord, this is the takeaway, and we're done. I want you to think this through. Take it very deeply. Nearly 50 years ago, God answered me. I said to the Lord, Lord, what and how did this woman get to this place? What, how did she get what she's got? How 
did she get that presence? And this is clear as nearly audible. He said, because she spends a lot of time with me in my presence. I go, come to that. Yeah. She spends a lot of time in my presence. And more is caught than taught. And you catch. I don't care what anyone tells you or what they say to you. That's good, but you're going to catch what they are, not what they say. You're going to catch it. So it's time to catch the Spirit. It's time to catch that. And so I want to admonish you guys, as much as we know how to spend time, you know, and before the Lord and the presence of the Lord. And to, uh, she did that with worship. And she would spend hours and hours just before the Lord, just with worship, worshiping God. And um, uh, I, I am uh, hopeful. I am hopeful that we make this shift in our life. If not, God will have to wait for another generation. And I, I don't think that's going to work out well for the earth. It needs to be us. It needs to be us. So here it goes. Stand with me, if you don't mind. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray for you and, uh, um, and pray for <clears throat> the hunger in your heart to be so big and ravishing that nothing is more important than the presence of God in your life. And all everything else bleeds from that presence. The presence is a centerpiece. Everything else is a byproduct. Your gift and your ministry, your, all your stuff, it's a byproduct, his presence. And Lord, I'm speaking for me. I'm speaking for the people in this building. I'm speaking for this church. I'm speaking for this nation. And I want to be courageous like Moses and say, Lord, I appreciate you doing supernatural stuff and sending us angels and taking us to new promised lands. But unless your presence go with me, it's just not the same. Unless your presence go with this church, with us, with this nation, with the church in the world, we're just not going to go up. It's not going to work for us. Because only when you go with us will the nations know and separate us from the other peoples in the earth. So, Lord, we're making that plea. And we're answering that proclamation by John the Beloved, your best friend, who said to the church of his day, the first century church at Ephesus, you need to return to your first love, to your presence, and to the foundation of everything that you are, and to the touch of Christ in your life, to a heart that's filled with the presence of God and the love of God. So, Lord, in all humility and all sincerity, we humble ourselves and we say, God, take not your presence from us. Do not cast us away and take your presence from us. Oh, we don't care about prospering in other areas if, unless we have your presence. And, Lord, would you bring your presence back and would you put your presence on us and would you touch us from heaven and will you embrace us? And, and then will you hold us in a place, a presence, where heaven touches earth, where there's no difference between the presence on earth and the presence in heaven. And we become one in the Spirit. And there's joy in your presence. And Lord, and in that presence, may it drive out the depression and the give up and the sickness and the weariness and the tiredness and all the stuff that we've been fighting, may that presence push it all away from us. And may that presence be so strong and so wonderful and so big that it will neutralize every other thing that has taken the place, every negative spirit, every evil spirit, every arrow of the devil, every thought of negativity that's coming to our heads. May your presence fill us. May we... Embrace the presence of God to such a degree that no negative, no demonic would even dare come close to a man or a woman filled with the presence of God. And Lord, we thank you for that presence. And Lord, I ask that you stir that presence in our spirit and that you recalibrate us 
that you realign us. We're looking for an assignment. We think there's something big coming, but not without an alignment. Bring us an alignment before you can give us the assignment. Realign us with your presence. Realign us with heaven. Realign us with priorities. And realign us in a way that is all about you. Create in us a clean heart, oh God. Create in us a clean heart and a cry that would cry out, oh my God, oh my God, my Savior is David did in the Psalms. Without you, I am nothing. You're a help and, and a present help in time of need. God, you're my everything. You're my water. You're more to me than water. Thank you, Lord, that you would be gracious enough to say to us like you did to Moses, okay, then I'll go with you. And you went with them, Lord, when you said you wasn't going to. And your presence went with them because Moses said, I'm not going unless you go with me. And Lord, we say that to you. We're not going forward unless you go with us. And we believe that that's what you want to hear and that you will do that. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for this year being the tipping point year, being the transitional year, being the year we put the stake in the ground, being the decisive year, being the year where we say we're changing, things are changing. We're going to do this thing right. We're getting out of this place that we're in. And all the weapons that are formed against us shall not prosper anymore. And the sickness, the depression, the disease, the hopelessness, the the craziness, the weirdness, all the stuff that the enemy has brought against us will no longer be because of your presence. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of the Lord and his Christ. And that is who we are. We are the army of the living God. We carry your banner. We carry your presence. And we will not bow our knee to Goliath anymore. And listen to the taunts and to the negative words and the cursing of our own thought life about ourselves as Goliath did. God, give us the heart of David that had enough confidence in your presence that he ran toward his accusation. He ran toward the problem and said, this day, this year, will God deliver you into our hands. And Lord, we declare that as a Davidic church that this time, this year, God will declare him. Say, Goliath, you've been living rent-free in our heads and we're casting you out. You've been living rent-free in our minds. You have, you have squatted in our minds and we say, no more. Our thoughts are his thoughts and our thoughts are godly. Our thoughts are are the thoughts of heaven. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the adjustment, that realignment. God, I can't do it. I don't know how you can do it. That's who you are. Just do it, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We say, do it, Lord. Do it. Do it. Return us again to the joy of our salvation. Return us to the joy of new birth and to the joy of first beginnings. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord for your kindness, thank you for your forgiveness, and thank you for your enduring love and the sense of fatherhood that you have, that you love us and you will embrace us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.